Good morning. It's a privilege to be here and to worship with Cross Point Family Church this morning. Uh, Jenna and I have both covered our tattoos as well for you. <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew. This is my wife, Jenna. Uh, our five-year-old daughter, Lucy, is here in the front row, and our two-year-old daughter, uh, Lily, is in the nursery, and, uh, and we are missionaries with the Church of the Nazarene. It's a, our privilege to come and speak, and, and this is part of our job as missionaries. We are currently between assignments. We just finished an assignment, like Lynn said, in Sri Lanka, and we're preparing for a brand new assignment as community engagement coordinators in, uh, or, or for the Australia and New Zealand field, and we will be living in New Zealand. Um, we just finished up our assignment in Sri Lanka. That's where Lily was born. That's a special place to us, and we're in this special time of transition where we're back in our home country, and we have the, the privilege and honor of of speaking in churches, of uh, preparing ourselves, and getting ready for our new ministry assignment. Now, New Zealand is familiar to both Jenna and me 10 years ago in 2011 and 2012, and for a real short time in 2013, uh, we lived and served in Hamilton, New Zealand. And that's the very same church we're going back to now 10 years later, and this time we get to bring Lucy and Lily with us, and we're excited, and, and I hope they're excited. I'm not sure if they are or not, but... Uh, if you don't know where New Zealand is, we've got a map of it. It's going to be up here behind me in just a moment. But New Zealand is a couple of islands, two islands on the bottom of the world, kind of east, southeast of, of Australia. You've probably heard the Australians refer to Australia as down under. Uh, and, 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 of course, the, you, you hear that quite a bit. But in New Zealand, they, they actually prefer to see the world a little bit differently. So I've got a second map up here you're going to see in just a second. The, the Kiwis, that's the people from New Zealand, prefer to see the world a little bit differently, and sometimes you'll see one of these cheeky maps that's flipped upside down, in which suddenly New Zealand sort of assumes a place of, of prominence that it doesn't usually have on our, on our world map. The Kiwis like to see it that way. Uh, it's a change in perspective, right? Suddenly what was up is down, and what was down is up. I found this interesting. Here in North America, if you want to turn on the lights, you flip the light switch up right? Most of the time you flip the light switch up. When you're in New Zealand, you have to push the light switch down. It takes a little while to get used to. We'll, we'll see how Lucy adjusts to that. Okay, and yet, think about this with me. Because you're on the bottom of the world, you're essentially standing upside down, and you're pushing the light switch down, it's still going the same absolute direction as here in North America, right? It used to keep me up at night thinking about that. Up is down, down is up. I, I love this flipped map. I love it because it challenges our expectations. It challenges how we see the world. It challenges what we expect when we look at the world. Up is down and, and down is up, just, just like the light switches in New Zealand. Because of the, the pandemic and uh, new variants that have emerged and closed borders, um, our family is currently waiting on visas to get to New Zealand. We expect it to be there in October, then we thought maybe January, and, and now we're hoping as soon as May we'll maybe be there. Uh, one of the things that we're asking for is that you would pray for us, that we would get visas to go to our new assignment as soon as possible. Um, but the silver lining in this time of, of, of transition, in this extended home assignment that we've had, is that our family has had the privilege of visiting and speaking and worshiping with 59 churches of the Nazarene across eight states over the last nine months. <laughs> Thank you. And it, and it is a privilege. I, I really mean that. It's a privilege to me and to rub shoulders with our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly in our church, in the Church of the Nazarene. In 1 Corinthians 3.9, the Apostle Paul uses the term uh, co-workers, or so, some translations say co-laborers. We are co-workers in God's mission. And I absolutely love that. Uh, we, that's, that's what we're doing. We are co-workers carrying out Jesus' great commission to make Christ-like disciples in every nation. And the Church of the Nazarene, it is local churches just like this one that love and support missionaries that allow missions to happen. If it wasn't for your love and support and your giving to the World Evangelism Fund and to Faith Promise and to Alabaster, uh, missionaries like Jenna and I wouldn't, able, wouldn't be able to do what we do. And so we want to say thank you. That's one of the most important things we can say this morning is we want to say thank you, church, for the way that you support missions. And we want to thank your pastor, Pastor Harf, and, and Pastor Craig. We want to thank your NMI president, Lynn. Uh, thank you for inviting us and supporting us and for hosting us well. It, it is an honor for us to be here. 
and to see our co-workers in God's mission. Part of, part of what I want to say here is we're not here just to give stories about what's going on in the mission field. We're here to give a report back to you on the investment that you've already made in God's mission around the world. God's doing amazing things all around the world. He's, he's doing amazing things here. He's at work in Ukraine. And he's at work in New Zealand. Uh, we're going to share some stories from New Zealand this morning. But in all of those places, we know this, we are facing challenges. And yet, in spite of those challenges, God is doing amazing things. Ten years ago, while Jen and I were in New Zealand, we were living in the city of Hamilton. It's on the North Island, uh, and it's about an hour south of Auckland. Auckland is the big city. We would drive up into Auckland uh, almost every weekend to visit a couple of churches there. We would take Highway 1, the main highway, north through from Hamilton up into uh, Auckland, the big city. And as we drove into Auckland, we would pass a billboard, and it said, Good Without God. Over one million Kiwis are. Again, a, a Kiwi is a person from New Zealand. This was in, tw- in uh, 2011. And the billboard was referencing a 2008 census. And in 2008, on the New Zealand census, over one million Kiwis, or about a quarter of the population, marked that they were non-religious. And the purpose of this billboard was to encourage even more Kiwis to mark that they were non-religious on the next census. It was going to happen 10 years later in 2018. And it seems like the billboard campaign worked. In the most recent census in 2018, 48% of Kiwis, or more than 2 million people, claimed no religion. So that's almost double the number in 10 years. And about 38% claimed that they were Christians, but only 15% acknowledged that they go to church on a Sunday morning. See, uh, much like the United States, much like our country, New Zealand has traditionally and historically been a Christian nation. And yet, in spite of that heritage, today New Zealand is, is one of the most secular countries in the world, one of the most secular societies in the world. Many people just simply see themselves, like the billboard said, as good without God. See, their, their kids go to good schools. They have high-quality health care. They live middle-class lifestyles. And these are things that the, the church and missions have, have taken part in. We've built schools, and we've built hospitals, and we've taken care of the poor. And yet in New Zealand, they're seemingly good without us, good without God. There's a lot of grandparents who still go to church, and yet the kids growing up today are at least a couple of generations removed from the church. And in many ways, in many ways, that's a lot like our culture. I think we can relate a lot to the situation in New Zealand. And yet I have good news for you this morning. Here's the good news. When the world thinks they're good without God, when the world thinks they don't need the church, I think we've got them right where we want them. Because God's power is made perfect in our weakness. It's easy to despair, right? It's easy to despair when the church loses power or the position that it once had. Uh, Even the disciples were tempted by power. They were expecting the Messiah to be a political leader, someone who would uh, reestablish David's ancient kingdom. Maybe they were even expecting him to be a military uh, leader, someone who would overthrow the Romans. Uh, Some people even think that Judas was just trying to finally get Jesus to fight back against the Romans when he betrayed him. That's not who Jesus was. That's that's not why he came. Instead, Jesus, he flipped those expectations upside down, right? He challenged the expectations that the disciples had of him. He turned them on their head. Instead, he came to serve rather than to be served. And he made himself weak, and God's power was made perfect in his weakness. I'll say it again. God is doing amazing things in New Zealand. Jen is going to share a story with you in in just a moment. But if we want to join in with what God is doing, not, not only in New Zealand, but here in our context, we have to flip our expectations. We have to maybe even see the world upside down. We have to seek to serve rather than to be served. Jenna. Well, good morning, everyone. What a privilege to be with you all this morning. We've had such a fun time getting to know 
uh, people and churches across your district. And Tampa is a new place for us. So we're really excited to be in Tampa this weekend and to bring our girls here. Thank you for your hospitality. And again, thank you for the way that you love missionaries. And we get to do what we do because of your faithfulness and your love and your participation in the mission of God. So thank you for that. I want to share with you this morning about my friend Elizabeth. And God is doing good things in New Zealand. God is at work all around the world. And we need to hear that over and over, that message of hope, especially in these days, right? So I want to share with you a story of hope, a story of encouragement from our church in New Zealand, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to share with you about Elizabeth. I think there's going to be a picture of her up on the screen. She's the one down on the floor with the kids in front holding a microphone. And this is Crossroads Church of the Nazarene. You're Cross Point. This is Crossroads. And this church is in Hamilton, New Zealand. It's a church that we got to serve at 10 years ago that we'll get to go back and serve at. And last year in 2021, Pastor Elizabeth here on the floor was serving at this church. And she and her family had lived in Hamilton for six years and had been involved in their community. They'd been getting to know their community, investing in their community, making relationships. They'd been serving this congregation. And they had seen good things happening. They'd seen spiritual, spiritual development They'd seen growth in the church. They'd seen God doing miracles in the lives of people around them. And then much like um, maybe your church faced here, COVID happened, and they had to get a little creative about the way that they did church. Just like here, a little bit later to here, but just like here, um, New Zealand faced the same kinds of lockdowns and mandates and inability to get together and gather as the church, inability to get together in person. And so Elizabeth and her congregation had to get creative. So in 2021, not long after this picture was taken, uh, Elizabeth had to find a new way to reach out to people in her community, an intentional way. She needed to find a way to serve that wasn't maybe the traditional way that she'd been serving for the last six years. And so uh, Elizabeth, her son had attended primary school. That's the, what, what they call elementary school in New Zealand. He'd been attending a primary school, and he'd been on a soccer team, and they had friends in their neighborhood, and they'd hosted block parties. And so they decided as a family that they would go around and they would meet their neighbors because that was something they could do in the midst of this COVID lockdown. They couldn't get together in their building with their church congregation. They couldn't gather in these large groups anymore, but they could go door to door and meet their neighbors. And in some of uh, those meetings, they had significant times of connection. And one such connection, Elizabeth met one of her neighbor friends, someone she already knew, and she went into her home and her friend said to her, you know, Elizabeth, I just lost my father. Now, this friend is an immigrant from another country, and so her father, back in her home country, he had passed away, and she was unable to get to her family in that other country because of the COVID restrictions, because New Zealand really has been closed for the last two years. So she couldn't leave New Zealand to be with her family and grieve the loss of her father. And so Elizabeth gathered her friends and her neighbors, and she said, we need to come around and support this grieving friend. She's far from her family in a time of of intense grief. And so they brought meals and they sat with her. And many of those people that Elizabeth recruited to come around and support this friend weren't even churchgoers, um, but they were people that she wanted to be an example to and wanted them to come alongside. She wanted to make service contagious. And so they began serving this family. And in the midst of serving that family, her friend, this grieving friend, said to Elizabeth, you know, uh, I know that you're a pastor and I know that pastors know how to pray And so I'm wondering if you would lead a service of celebration for my father's life. And Elizabeth said, I would love to to help you with that. So they began to plan this service. And as they planned, Elizabeth said, you know, it sounds like maybe more people than will fit in your house want to come to this service. And at this point, things had opened up enough that they could get together in, in the church building. So Elizabeth said, why don't we have the service at this Crossroads Church of the Nazarene? And she said, well, Elizabeth, I'm a Hindu. My father was a Hindu. Are you sure it's okay for us to have his memorial service in your church? And Elizabeth said, we would love to have you. And so they began to plan this service, and they invited the congregation to come and to help serve, to be hospitable, to um, serve the tea and make the food and welcome people as they came in. And they invited the coworkers of this friend and the neighborhood people and the soccer team friends and the primary school friends. Many of these people had never been in a church building before, And they planned and executed this service for this man thousands of miles away. They invited the family to join by Zoom. And it so happens that the family were so moved by the significance of this service in this moment, they didn't even have their own funeral service back in the the country. 
But really the significance of this story is not what happened in the service, but afterward. There was conversation. There was mingling of these Christ followers, these people who are trying to serve and be obedient, the church people that were gathered there mingled, and they had conversations, and they started relationships, and they answered questions. And God is really working through that moment and that uh, act of obedience that the church had in hosting that service. And that's just one way. We saw that you have a basketball court outside. Uh, The Crossroads Church has also has built a basketball court in the last few years. They have a factory next door, and the factory workers are mostly young men. They like to shoot hoops on their lunch break. And so the church said, we have some extra land. We'll build a basketball hoop, and they can come shoot hoops here. And our pastors can go out and shoot hoops with them. So that's another way that they've tried to think creatively and to love their community. They use another parcel of their land to make into an orchard and a family garden where neighbors can come that don't have room on their own property and they can plant vegetables and fruits and things grow great in New Zealand. So they come and they plant and they mingle together and the church people come and the neighborhood people come and it's an opportunity for them to work together with their hands in the garden. So this church, this church is a church that is trying to serve its community. It's trying to reach out. Now I want to remind you of the context. Andrew's just shared with you, New Zealand is one of the most secular nations in the world, a nation that is seemingly good without God. They say it on their billboards. They say it with their lifestyles. So I want to remind you that this is not an easy place to be the church. This is a church, Crossroads Church, whose society thinks of it as antiquated. And this is a church whose neighborhood doesn't really care for a church. They don't really want a church. They'd much rather have a community center. This is a church whose culture doesn't see its value, and it's not a flashy church. That's basically the whole of the church building right there. It's one hall with a kitchen off one side. They don't have a big budget. They don't have a huge leadership team or a large large pastoral staff. They don't have a ton of resources, but they are a church that desires to serve their community. They're a church that's taken the words of Jesus to heart, And they're trying to find ways to serve and live incarnationally in their neighborhood. So it wasn't a trap. This service that they held in their church and the basketball court and the the gardens, they're not a trap to get people to come in. But they're rather a place where the church can be transformed and to become people who serve in their communities, who go out, who use the building that they have, but also who go out and who serve in incarnational ways in the places that they live. It's that model that Christ gives to us in the Gospels, that model of self-giving, self-sacrificing love, not expecting um, notice, not expecting the affirmations of the people, the neighborhood around, but just serving for the purpose of serving. We don't know how this story ends. This isn't one of those great missionary stories that I can tell you, wrap it up with a big red bow. I have some of those if you want to see me after the service. Those are fun too. But this is a really great story, and I share it with you because it's a testimony in progress. There are a lot of people involved in this story. There are dozens of families that have been touched by this particular event, not just the grieving family, but all the neighbors who observed what happened, all the people that came along, the coworkers, the primary school friends. And I want you with me to pray that God would continue to do his good work. There are seeds being grown right now because of the faithfulness of some of these servants in Crossroads Church. And I want you to pray with us that God would continue to grow those seeds. It is slow growing work in New Zealand. We lived there 10 years ago. We can tell you stories of 10 years later, there is some growth happening, but it's slow growing work, just like here. So pray with us that God would continue to grow those seeds and pray with us for the the church in Hamilton, for this church, our church, your brothers and sisters in Christ who are seeking to be faithful. It doesn't look flashy. Um, it's, it looks like serving tea. It looks like opening the door for people. It looks like going and meeting with people who are grieving in their homes. It looks like serving food. It looks like being a friend. And hopefully that can be an encouragement and, a, and an empowerment for us today. It doesn't have to look flashy. It just, we just need to serve. And we believe that Jesus is glorified by their faithfulness, and Jesus is glorified when we choose to serve faithfully. We're talking about uh, seeking to serve rather than to be served. And, of course, Jesus gave us the, the ultimate model for that. And, and uh, that model is exemplified in 
Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read Philippians chapter 2 in just a moment, and it'll be on the screen. Um, but in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Jesus' service is remembered in, in a hymn, one of the hymns of the early church. We're going to read it, but I want to think about the church in Philippi for just a moment. Of course, Paul wrote Philippians to the church in Philippi. And the church in Philippi was a church in a Roman colony living under a Caesar who himself aspired to be God. Probably at this time it was Nero who was the first of the Roman empires to uh, take on the term Lord for himself. So this was a church in Philippi that, that risked their livelihoods, sometimes their lives, every time they declared that Jesus was Lord because that was Nero's title. This was a church whose society didn't want them if they, if they even noticed them at all. And yet this church in Philippi uh, heard Jesus' great commission to go and make Christ-like disciples. And they looked at the nations around them, the hostile nations around them, and they said, we've got them right where we want them. So Paul wrote to that church. And this is what he said. He said, this is how you ought to serve your neighbor. This is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And then what follows is the is the, the hymn of the early church. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, even the way that Jesus died on a cross was a shameful death. Crucifixion was uh, reserved for non-citizen criminals. And the church in Philippi should have been embarrassed that that's how their Lord died. And yet, Paul celebrates it in this hymn. The story that Philippians chapter 2 celebrates is, is a story of, of, of a downward journey, of Jesus' downward journey uh, to that cross, ultimately to the grave. We read the Apostles' Creed this morning, and uh, there are people who think that the Apostles' Creed was actually modeled, or at least the, the section on Jesus was modeled after this hymn. If you remember what we said about Jesus, it's the same story of descent. Jesus descended from heaven to earth, down to the cross, and ultimately to the grave. He didn't just descend to our level, right? He descended below our level and died that non-citizen criminal's death. Our culture, on the other hand, values upward mobility. We hear this term sometimes, right? It means climbing the, the social ladder. It's kind of like that Roman emperor who aspired to be God, right? He wanted to elevate himself. And yet Jesus exemplifies exactly the opposite. That church in Philippi would have recognized that, that this is counter to the culture in which we live. Jesus exemplified descending the social ladder to that position of a servant. I heard another missionary call it downward mobility. I kind of like that. Downward mobility. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is calling the church in Philippi to embrace in this hymn. To a church that, that already has no power, no place in their society, Paul says, you've got them right where you want them. Because God's power is, is made perfect in your weakness. Of course, we know, we know the end of the story, right? Jesus is descent, Jesus' story didn't end in the grave. When he humbled himself, God exalted him. When he humbled himself, God showed his power, and God reversed that descent, and Jesus ascended to a position of power and authority at the right hand of God. This is, this is how the hymn concludes. This is Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, right, therefore, because Jesus humbled himself. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. First Jesus descended to the position of the servant, and then God exalted him. That's, that's the same model in the Apostles' Creed. It talks about Jesus' descent, and then it reverses, and God exalts him. 
And yet it's that first part, the descent, the downward mobility, that we are called to imitate. And it's the exact opposite of our inclinations, right? We, we are inclined to seek power and authority. If we want to join in with what God is doing, if we want to imitate Jesus, though, we have, to, we have to flip our expectations again. We have to see the world upside down, and we have to seek to serve rather than to be served. As missionaries on home assignment, Andrew told you, we visited a lot of churches, and it's our privilege to come and just hopefully encourage and bring hope and bring greetings from your brothers and sisters around the world and bring that report to you of the good things that God is doing in all the places in the world. And so um, we love to bring this just message of encouragement that even when it feels like a time that we should feel discouraged, when we feel like uh, it's a time that we should be disillusioned, when we feel disappointed with the world around us and with the things that are happening, when we feel sometimes personally attacked and tempted to reject the culture around us because they think they're good without us. That happens here too. That happens here too. When we feel um, tempted to reject or just kind of even look away, maybe it's a sin of omission, (laughs) just look away and to maybe focus inwardly. When we are tempted to do that, Christ calls us to love and Christ calls us to serve. And Christ calls us toward lives and ministries of downward mobility, like he called Elizabeth and her congregation in New Zealand to find creative ways to get into the homes and into the lives of their neighbors. Christ calls us to do that kind of ministry, that kind of simple but sometimes hard ministry. And when we are obedient to that call, then God has us right where he wants us. That's where he wants us. He wants us joining with him, serving and joining in with his mission around the world. And we are participants in transformation when we are obedient to serve. We're participants in not only the transformation of the people around us, but we ourselves are transformed in the act of service. And when we get to be participants in the mission of God, really that is um, that opportunity to be co-laborers with God. We used that language earlier. We get to be co-laborers in the mission, the restoration that he is doing in the world. He is doing restorative work in the world. If you hear nothing else, this is just this moment of hope. He is doing good things. It feels like it's all bad if you watch the news. But he is doing good restorative work. And people are being called. And people are finding the Lord. And he is growing his church around the world. Our family feels privileged that we get to go and serve. That we get to be a part of the church on the Australia-New Zealand field. That we get to go and be in that church that you saw a picture of earlier. Um, the Hamilton Church of the Nazarene, Crossroads Church. The Church of the Nazarene in New Zealand is actually part of the larger field. We've said it a couple of times now. Our church is in both New Zealand and Australia, and our field has three districts. You're a part of a district here, so we have three districts on our field, two in Australia and one in New Zealand. And one of the things we'd love to just ask you to do with us today is to pray for the pastors and leaders on those three districts. It is a difficult context in New Zealand and in Australia, difficult, difficult, secular context, difficult work. It looks very different from the kind of ministry that we were doing in Sri Lanka. It's a different world. And would you pray with us that our pastors and leaders, like Elizabeth, others would be encouraged and equipped and empowered, that they would have creative and intentional ways of reaching out and loving their communities Um, In these times of difficult days, they are still enduring lockdowns in New Zealand and Australia. They're a bit behind. They're down there on the bottom of the world. They're isolated. They're islands. And especially in New Zealand, they're just a little bit behind our schedule here with the COVID pandemic. So they're still locked in country, hopefully opening up this spring, spring here. Um, And so would you pray with us that our pastors and leaders would just have a fresh uh, sense of encouragement, that God would give them peace, that God would give them creativity as they minister. And would you pray for the people of Australia and New Zealand, these people who believe that they're good without God, would you pray that God would use even that attitude to be an opportunity to shift that around, to turn it upside down, and that they would see themselves in need, and that they would see their need for God, and that the church could come and show them love and grace and hope and acceptance, and really that the church could point them to Jesus Christ. Would you pray with us that 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 would happen? We have hope today. We want to leave you 
with hope. We have hope because God has them right where he wants them. He is at work in their lives long before they know. And he has us right where he wants us. Our family has been in this weird time of waiting, of transition, a really long transition, much longer than we thought. But God has us right where he wants us. And we know that as we visited churches Um, all over the United States in the past nine months that God has used this time to transform us and to develop us and to equip us. And that also, hopefully, he's used it as a time to encourage the church. So we'd love for you to join us in praying. Pray for the church in Australia, New Zealand, your brothers and sisters there. We really are a global church. That's why we get to come and stand here and share with you. We are part of a global church. You are a part of a global church. And God is at work through his church around the world. So pray with us for the church in New Zealand and Australia. Please pray for our family as we wait for visas. Um, Pray that those borders will open in April and that we will be able to get there as soon as possible. And I want to, I see lots of young faces and I never ever, young and old, I never want to miss this opportunity. Um, We are not special. We are just people who want to follow Jesus and love and serve him. And there may be people in this room, young and old. I see lots of young faces, so I always want to take the opportunity because I was seven years old when God called me to be a missionary. So maybe some of you kids that stayed in the service today to color your picture of your Kiwi need to hear that God is calling you too. And maybe some of you older folks need to hear that God is calling you. I get to work with the Engaging and Equipping team, which is the Church of the Nazarene's missionary sending arm. And we send missionaries from over 60 countries all over the world. And so maybe you are a missionary that God is calling. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. And if you are, you feel... God calling you to serve. I know it feels like the world has stopped and travel is hard, but God is still calling people to go and cross cultural boundaries to serve him and cross cultural ministry. So come and find me after the service, and I would love to talk with you. We do have a newsletter that we send out. We need your email if you want to receive that. And we have some cards, prayer cards for our field and for our family. So please come and visit with us. We love to meet people after the service and at the potluck. Um, Even if you didn't bring anything, you should still come and meet us. So anyway, thank you so much for having us. I'm going to pass it now back to the pastor. Thank you, Andrew and Jenna. I want to thank you for responding to the call of God. That's not an easy thing. So thank you for responding to his call. And it is our great privilege to partner with you in ministry. Church, I want to encourage you uh, to greet them on your way out today. Pick up their information so that you can pray for them and partner with them in ministry. Uh, Edith and I have always wanted to go to New Zealand. So, uh, yeah, we'd love to come over there. And uh, your church, the church you're going to, that looks awesome. This is a generous church. And we want to bless them today with a generous offering. And so I would like to encourage you to give what God uh, would ask you to give. If you'll just mark it that way. Uh, anything, um, anything that's unmarked will go to their ministry, okay? We'll make it that way. Or if you want to designate a check to them, please do so. And we want to bless them in their mission work. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for them. Lord, our hearts have been stirred this morning with uh, Andrew and Jenna's testimony and their sharing. Lord, I thank you for the call that you have placed on their life. Thank you for calling Jenna when she was seven years old to the mission field. We believe that you still do that. And Lord, if there's somebody here that fills you speaking, I pray that they would respond by saying yes right now to your call. We pray, Lord, that you would provide the visas in a timely manner for the Stouts, that they would be able to get those quickly, and that they would be able to get to New Zealand and and get back to the work that you have called them to. And so we pray that you would open doors for them In the strong name of Jesus. We pray for these three districts. The two in Australia and the one in New Zealand. We pray, Lord, that your hand of blessing would be upon the districts. We would pray, Lord, as the pastors are 
uh, kind of coming out of this season of COVID, that you would give them a brand new touch, that you would encourage them in ministry. I pray that the joy of the Lord would be their strength and uh, that you would open up uh, windows of opportunity and that you would lead them and guide them and bring them to a, a fresh place in ministry. And Lord, for the, the people in that country who think that they are good without you, God, I pray that you would use Crossroads Church in these three districts, Lord, to be a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden, that would be a light to New Zealand and Australia, Lord, we pray that you would use uh, Andrew and Jenna and the team that they are with, Lord, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to one person at a time. And Lord, I, we pray that spiritual multiplication would take place. Now, Lord, we, it's our joy to partner with them in ministry. I pray that you would receive this offering that we are giving to them for their ministry. I pray that you would take it and multiply it and use it for the building of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Be sure and, and uh, greet our dear missionary friends. Can we just give them a hand one more time? God bless you. Stay for the potluck. You're dismissed.